Okay. We are working. Awesome. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. I am a little late this week. Sorry about that. Uh, having computer issues here at home. Uh, but we have power, which is great, considering the thunderstorms are raging here. Uh, I am your host, Nicole Gallucci, postdoc at Cosmo Quest. Uh, my co-host, Georgia Bracey, is at a conference, so she won't be joining us this week, sadly, but she'll be back next week. Uh, and I have with me two guests here, Emily Fink and Liz Neely. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello. Uh, <laughs> so if you are watching us live, you can interact with us using the Q&A app uh, through Google Plus and on the YouTube video wherever it is broadcasting. Um, so yeah, so we have a couple people over on the Q&A chat already. Hi, Michael, Nancy, and Guido. Uh, you were getting an error message because I was late. Sorry about that. <laughs> but we're all here now. Uh, so you go ahead and use the Q&A app. Um, we are no longer tracking the event page and YouTube page comments. Um, it seems to be working out with the Q&A app. So please use that if you want to ask a question or leave a comment uh, during this discussion today. Um, so let's uh, go ahead and get started. Um, so Emily, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little about your background as a science educator. Okay. I am Emily Fink. I have worked in museums and nature centers, all sorts of science education involving not a formal structure. So right now I'm currently not at a museum, but I do science talks for science fiction conventions. So I'll go talk about the science of superheroes or Doctor Who or genetics in Game of Thrones or things like that. Yes, and Emily's also one of my favorite cosplayers. <laughs> uh, and Liz, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and uh, where you're working and what's your background. Yeah, sure. Hi, everybody. My name is Liz Neely. I'm the Assistant Director of Science Outreach with a nonprofit organization called Compass. And so what I do is actually help researchers understand how they can be more effective in talking to journalists and to policymakers. So in some ways, I'm a communications coach and trainer. I'm based at the University of Washington in Seattle and uh, spend quite a bit of time traveling around the country. Very cool. Yes, and, and we all know that uh, scientists can definitely use help talking to <laughs> journalists. Well, as, a, as a former scientist myself, I certainly had to learn how to take my own medicine and, and walk the talk. Awesome, awesome. So uh, I thought it would be an interesting discussion to talk some about uh, the science behind science communication and some of, and, and one of the common pitfalls of science communicators, myself included, um, stemming from discussions we had at Science Online recently uh, in North Carolina. So that was, a, uh, was that the beginning of March, end of February? I, I, yeah, end of February. Yeah. Okay, so that, was, that was about a month ago. I'm losing track already. <laughs> Um, and there was a, a lot of talk on the Twitter stream and in, in some of the sessions about the deficit model. And I had no idea what that is. And people were using that term. And, and, I, and uh, although it turns out I did kind of have an idea, I just didn't know there was, there was a name for it. So, so maybe can you define what is the deficit model? Sure. Um, I'll take a crack at this first because I organized a session two years ago at Science Online called why won't the science deficit model die? We use yes. zombies as our theme for that. Uh, <laughs> so the, the deficit model when it comes to communication is not the idea that education is bad or wrong or that people don't want to be educated. Sometimes it's misinterpreted that way. But mm. really what it is is it's explaining that there's a logical inconsistency when people are frustrated about why the public or certain groups don't appreciate love um, or care about science and they think that the answer is to continue to throw more information um, at those audiences. And so really this is about making sure that it's clear that people are not empty vessels just waiting to be filled, that the only thing they need is more information in order to care, but rather that they have an entire set of values, priorities, worldviews um, that are legitimate and that sometimes simply throwing more data at them can exacerbate their resistance to what the science might be saying. Emily, have you um, seen the deficit model being used in, in the museum world? 
Uh, maybe oh. have you seen it go on and fail or <laughs> yeah that's actually when I first started doing informal education I had no training in it so I didn't know the words for deficit model or any of the theoretical constructs of education but I knew that when I threw information at the visitors of the museum or at the nature center kids it wasn't sticking um, when I was just sticking to the fact just sticking to the concepts in the last story in the lesson guides, it just wasn't working as well until I started really having conversation with visitors. So still, um, I actually have a tendency to teach things like evolution without using the word evolution because it's counterproductive when you're teaching at a museum that's a half an hour from the Creation Museum. Whereas I can teach concepts I can get people to relate to a concept without actually saying you must understand evolution as this set of facts that entirely conflicts with your worldview. And it got a lot of pushback from curators, from museum administrators. Why, why are you kowtowing to them? I'm not. I'm just taking into account the audience I have, which is a group of people who are very interested in science, very science literate, but don't necessarily accept the things that we all take to be um, science. Mm -hmm. They have an entirely different definition of science. So. And I also consider myself someone who doesn't have any formal education in being an educator. Um, and so that that's still something that I run into all the time. Um, why I, I, I do that to people want information. Let's 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 talk about information. Uh, let's give them the facts. What? Uh, why? Why does it seem like it's so easy for educators to to fall into that? I think some of it is the way that we're trained, um, yeah. especially with the researchers I work with. You know, you, you go through school and you get really good at sitting in lectures and looking for sort of. Um, information to be passed to you from your professors and so we kind of fall, we default into this model of I'm the professor and I'm going to teach you about something that you need to understand and the most important currency in that is that you have your facts correct and that's I think I think so the problem is not necessarily that that never works it works really well in some specific settings mm -hmm. uh, but it fails terribly when there's people who don't want to be educated or not interested in, in being lectured at um, or have other things other than facts like their values that mm -hmm. might be more important for driving it's it's not so much about what is the correct information about the way the world works or what we're seeing but really the question is what are we going to do about it and that's not a not a science uh, conversation in many instances sure um, what, what cases does it actually seem to work well, I mean, I think I was thinking really hard about this last night um, because sometimes when you go through the process of trying to give people more information, you may inadvertently hit on something that's interesting to them. Like, I have to admit, I was a, you guys are going to kill me, a latecomer to actually enjoying space, to be interested in space science of any, of any sort. And so it so didn't matter. <laughs> So for me, for someone like me, like just hearing over and over again how many planets there were and interesting facts about exoplanets, like, yeah, you know, I already, I wasn't really that interested. And so, honestly, for me, the first real connection I made to it was at an event where Seth MacFarlane donated a bunch of papers from Carl Sagan to the Library of Congress. And what influenced me so strongly was watching person after person stand up and talk about the influence that Carl Sagan had had on their life through his writings, through letters he wrote to them, through mentorship and that sort of thing. Um, and then listening to some of Cosmos and starting to get into that with Neil deGrasse Tyson, it appealed to my aesthetic interests and sort of my interest in other people and in scientists and science communication. And that, for me, was how I kind of, how I got into space science. It had nothing to do with amazing data about mm -hmm. everything that's out there. Yeah. And I think it works very, very well with a group that most of my background is geared towards working with. Small children are sponges. They can literally be, not literally, sorry, it's been a long day. They can literally be empty buckets that you're pouring facts into and they're sapping those up. And that does work with small children given that their parents are not directly contradicting you. 
So yeah, if you already have, if you have a family setting that isn't going to be teaching creationism or something like that, you actually do have an empty bucket that wants to be filled with facts and that will go out and find the facts themselves. If they're not told, they can't do that. Um, but with adults or with children from communities that are not engaged in science or have some distrust in science, it doesn't work and it can be very counterproductive even with the kids. If you're, say, I spend a lot of time teaching Boy Scout troops and if you're teaching Boy Scout troops in Cincinnati, you have a lot of very religious geared children. So they've been hearing the creationism all their lives, um, even as young children. So I would have to be going through something about geology, a basic badge requirement for Boy Scouts, and have to be dancing around geologic time so I could still make them understand the enormity of how cool mountains are and how fun a lot of this stuff is and how interesting without actually stepping on the things that they consider part of themselves. And that's with kids as young as eight, nine. Mm -hmm. I think some topics of science just are better suited, um, you know, so one of our friends and colleagues gave a TED talk um, at the end of yeah. February on parasites and uh, mind control, how animals infected with certain types of parasites might do really crazy things like go to the nearest body of water and drown themselves so that the worm infesting that cricket could swim away. Um, that kind of like science that's just really gross or really cool, you know, cannibalism, hermaphrodites, you know, all that kind of gee whiz, just a made natural wonder type stuff, feels like there is, it's easier to sh simply share bizarre facts about what animals are doing um, than it is, it's, it's not quite the same as trying to help people understand fishery science or climate or, you know, atmospheric research and that kind of stuff. I think that's that's why the um, penises of the animal kingdom panel is always so well attended yeah. at whatever yeah. column that shows up. <laughs> the convergence or all of them. <laughs> yeah, all of them. I think I've seen that several yeah. times. Because yeah, you're right. People just say, "Oh, penises." All right, Excel. <laughs> yeah, uh, Nancy then... Graziano uh, added a comment. Uh, this is about the uh, kids being sponges. Uh, she points out we had a little girl who was probably about six or seven in one of the, the astronomy panels that we did, and she blew us away. Uh, she, uh, she said she just ate up all that, she, well, Nancy says she ate up all that I had to say, uh, but I also remember her adding on with all the facts she knew, and she was like seven years old. Yeah. Um, and that, that's an example of someone who was like, facts, 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 what to yeah. know stuff. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily last. Well, because that kind of thing, like watching somebody who's so engaged with facts and can give you all this information you never knew, it can be really fun and exciting because you watch their eyes light up and they're mm -hmm. sharing stuff that's kind of wild and it's both impressive to see that body of knowledge and can draw you in sometimes. But for the most part, like if you don't have, again, that intrinsic connection to whatever the facts are about, it becomes, it's an opportunity cost, right? It's, it, the question is, why should I keep listening to you talk? What am I going to get out of this? Like, how does this fit into what I care about and the context of the broader world? Mm -hmm. And so being able to really address the so what of that question and not make assumptions that the audience already shares your values that shape that so what for you. Um, in the kind of work that I do, the trainings that Compass engages in, that's what we focus on helping scientists understand that it might be that they need to lead with that context, why we should care, a personal story, their own passion and connection to a topic rather than just, you know, facts straight off the box. Sorry, I, my cat is fighting with my headphones. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> I can hear again. Good, 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 good. Did you have something you wanted to add, Emily? I did have something I wanted to add. Oh, um, but cats. <laughs> yes, but cats. Cats. Uh, I think actually, on back on the parasite thing, what yeah. is it? That Ed Young does very well, and many, many other science writers, Jacqueline Gill is another one who does it very well, is they take the facts, but it's not just fact, 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 fact. It's either this is really interesting, this is something that tells you about the world you're living in, and here's why, and then there, or there's something of 
let me give you the context for this. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is why the scientist is interested in asking this question. Even leading people through that process of, well, why is, why is there a scientist studying ant parasites? What possible relevance does that have? People will see that headline and, yeah, they'll probably listen to the TED Talk and go, okay, that's really cool and gross, so I'm going to share it because it's gross. But one thing that um, a really good science communicator does is lead the person back to the science from that and give them something that tells them why, why is this something I should even care about? Well, you want to care about parasites because, well, we have a little parasite-ridden vector that just tried to steal my headphones <laughs> um, living in our house. And it's, it's something you don't think about, but it is there are connections all over that aren't just based on the facts. Yeah. And I think this kind of leads into another element that I think educators are, in some instances, better at than scientists, which is storytelling mm -hmm. and recognizing that even though for some of us facts are beautiful and we love to have big collections of them to share, uh, not everybody geeks out together that same way. And this, that stories are the mechanisms that we as a species have evolved as the best way to package information in a way that's sticky so that we share who we are, what we care about, how we survive, and then spread that over time and space in a very effective manner. And so there's lots of really interesting research going on now in the social sciences about the power of narrative, what makes it memorable, how people sort of use them to slide new knowledge into an existing scaffolding of how they, they see the world. Mm -hmm. And it, it reminds me a little bit of what we're talking about with the deficit model of thinking. We just need to keep piling on more facts because when you look at some of our other colleagues who teach storytelling skills, like Randy Olson, um, he says scientists often fall into this pattern, he calls it a pile of sundry facts where we just keep saying and, 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 and throwing and piling up information. And what we need to be able to do is to add sort of that tension and the arc of a story that makes it a story, which is how people remember it. And so instead of and, 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 his um, structure is and, but, and therefore. And that mm -hmm. way, like Emily was saying, really good science writers are able to take really cool facts and then connect it to something rather than it just being this standalone, you know, gee whiz oddity. And I think stories are really, that's what it helps us do, is take an interesting fact and turn it into something memorable that we help us understand the world and that we can share. And a story can help depoliticize something. Um, there is a power towards to taking something out of a political news, scary context and putting it in a personal context, whether that's a personal context of narrative, uh, personal context of fiction. There's, there are a lot of fiction writers that do an excellent job of packaging science and why we should care about certain topics in their fiction. Uh, particularly young adult writers right now um, are doing a good job at that. Mm -hmm. there, that, that takes that, con that contentious idea, whether that's something like climate change or evolution or um, genetically modified foods, and it puts them into a context where you can actually take some time and engage with that subject without it directly challenging who you are. And we, even I, I myself in my communication, I do have a bad tendency to say, and you need to understand evolution because it's basic. Yeah, yeah, because biology, but because biology does not matter to most people. Like, the fact that biology doesn't make sense without evolution is not something that anyone cares about. But when they start looking at um, a fiction novel about um, diseases mm -hmm. mutating or about crops, uh, about genetically modified organisms, anything like that, they can then engage with that subject without necessarily it saying, you are wrong as a person. This is, so what Emily's talking about reminds me of why I'm so excited to be sort of working in this field at this particular moment in time because whether we're looking at this sort of confluence of fiction and nonfiction science writing or um, bringing together the craft of science writing and journalism with the research side of uh, psychology and risk perception and, and the rest of that, I think we've wasted a fair bit of time um, arguing sort of like the science and humanities or 
uh, well, those researchers are telling me that everything I'm doing in my communications is wrong based on their new research. And, and I really don't see it that way. I see this as a sort of wide open space where wildly interdisciplinary collaborations are going to be really exciting in helping us all figure out how to how to do this better, whether, you know, the science around, like I said, risk perception and analysis, rhetoric, design thinking, um, writing fiction, graphic arts and design, you know, there, there's just so much that we can talk about in terms of telling really effective science stories. Uh, I think one issue is that uh, a lot of us who maybe got into science early on or have been passionate about it, um, I, I was reminded by one of the professors uh, that I, I work with that, you know, you're, you're one of a small percentage. Um, our personal interest in science, maybe we did respond to the facts. Maybe yeah. we did want to go after it. Um, and, and the realization that not everyone thinks that way, in fact, most of our audience may not be initially interested or be hungry for the facts for facts sake. Uh, is 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 troubling and surprising to many scientists and science educators. I, th I think that actually dovetails nicely with Nancy's question um, oh. about informal science. Um, her, she asked a question, in your opinion, is it easier for informal science educators to get through to some of the resistant public than it is for those who have been trained as educators? And actually, I would say, yeah, it's easier for journalists or informal educators, um, people who have a non- compulsory audience, mm -hmm. we, we learn very, very quickly what makes someone walk away. Um, my audience, no matter where I've been, either they are able to just walk away. No, there's no contract, nothing they, they need from me aside from what I can give them that's interesting. Or in the case of kids, they just start punching the next kid rather than listening to me. So. <laughs> I had to learn how to play nicely with the creationists and still get science across. And it was a forceful thing. It was something that I did not learn teaching a college class. It was something I did learn talking to families with four-year-olds and grandparents at the museum um, because the college kids had to sit there and listen to me, whereas the four-year-olds did not have to sit there and listen to me. And as a scientist, I certainly didn't learn any of that. <laughs> For me, it was, it's funny, I, I came up through, um, you know, I went straight into my PhD in marine biology, but I, I did learn it a little bit in science because I would recognize a couple of different things. My one roommate when I was an undergraduate, when I would start talking to her about stuff I was really excited about, her eyes would just start to go up into the distance, she would look over my head, and I was really sensitive, I was really sensitive to that, so... I realized I was losing her attention even though she was still physically standing there. Mm -hmm. um, or I would listen to how my mom would describe what I was doing to her friends and when I would see the mismatch between what I thought I was doing and how she was telling them what I was doing, I realized that it wasn't very effective that way either. So even when we have compulsory audiences, even even then, you know, you're still fighting for that attention and engagement. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe some of this has to do with um, our ego and uh, reputation, that you feel like by the time you have a PhD or you're teaching or that you've earned a certain degree of respect, that you've worked really hard and you, you're very knowledgeable and you want people to sit there and sort of applaud you for, for that. And, and maybe the other element of that is that our, our own Genesis stories, the things that we care so much about that we're de dedicating our whole lives to, of course we feel protective of that. And to hear somebody be like, yawn, yeah. this is boring, like, I don't, I don't like space stuff. <laughs> you know, like, of course that would feel um, insulting. And I think that's something that anybody who's doing science communication, whether it's in an educational context or science communication in the media or whatever, realizing it's not about you and being able to control your your emotional response to that perceived slight is an important part of this as well. So we've talked about a couple of different ways um, that are more effective. Uh, embedding it in a story, so storytelling is important. Uh, context or relevance to the person's life. Mm -hmm. um, it's briefly mentioned uh, fitting it into their already existing scaffolding. That's something that 
uh, ed formal educators have to focus on as well as informal educators is, is, is respecting or understanding that they come with a pre-existing knowledge. They're not empty buckets. <laughs> They're not empty vessels. Uh, sometimes you have to break down what you think you know before you can build up new knowledge. Um, what other tactics or, or modes of expression seem to be effective? Emily? Either from experience or from, re from research. Um, well, I, I have a ten bad tendency from informal education to go into what is tends to be group known as um, edutainment, where I use I heavily use props and I heavily use demos where I'm doing something, mm -hmm. and it works. Um, my my struggle is I then need to tie it back to whatever information I'm trying to get through to people. But I, I use a lot of props and a lot of, a lot of, as much, not flashy, but just things. Like, mm -hmm. if I'm talking about fossils, I'm going to have this thing there and tell its story. Well, back to storytelling. I do a lot of storytelling. <laughs> Um, when you look to the fields of rhetoric and the science communication research about things that work and don't work, one of the things I like to think about is um, you might remember from like English high school classes, logos, ethos, pathos is different ways of building an argument. And so many of us in science are really good at the logos, the logic, the data. We've already talked about the deficit model and all that. But thinking about those other two, so the appeals to emotion when, when appropriate, whether that emotion is fear, because sometimes fear-based appeals really do work quite well in terms of changing opinions or behavior, though they're not always, there's no easy answers, that's the tricky thing. There's no like algorithm for effective science communication. Um, but then also uh, the whole ethos thing, which is really has to do with the reputation of the messenger, whoever is delivering the science communication. That's hard, right? Because we know that um, sometimes for some audiences, you might, just by virtue of the way you look and who you are, come across as um, a messenger that they don't trust yeah. or they're not um, sort of engaged with. And so whether that means forming unorthodox partnerships with communities or perhaps if that's not appropriate or possible, even you know, drawing those voices into what you're doing by quoting them or featuring people who are trusted by that particular audience can be a better way than simply trying to just hammer home more and more facts. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there, um, it wasn't in in your particular session, but there was another session where we talked about. I think it was a different session. Um, persuasiveness, or was that your session, Liz? So that was Melanie. I think it bled Bob. into your session. That's right. And and people's. Comfort, level of comfort or discomfort with actually seeing themselves as d being persuasive or using tactics that might otherwise be used in advertising. Maybe yeah. you can talk a bit about that. Yeah, I um, I felt I often find myself feeling rather uncomfortable when it gets into this territory of where is the line between understanding incredibly effective science communication, which is very persuasive, versus something being manipulative. Mm -hmm. And so there's um. If you're interested in more about this, there's a conference happening at Iowa State University. It's co-led by um, Michael Dahlstrom about the ethics of effective science communication. And I know that a lot, there's a lot of um, work that we can look to in healthcare fields about um, when does something become a legitimate informed consent versus the kinds of techniques that we can use in forms to get people to fill in forms you know, the way that the experimenters want them to. But I do think it's really important that anyone who wants to communicate science realizes that you are you are selling something. You're selling the idea that what you have to say is important enough for people to spend their time on. And hopefully that the information you're sharing with them, they're going to do something with, whether it changes their sense of awe in the world or their voting habits or their behaviors at home. We're not just doing this, you know, just for the sake of doing it. And so I think we have to be incredibly careful about our own motivations to respect the personhood and integrity um, and right of people to really grapple with the information and not just be used as pawns. Like I, This is where I think the marketing research can be very useful, but sometimes is not necessarily what we as science communicators would embrace fully or to the same degree. 
Yeah, I made a crack that uh, it depends on the stakes, right? So I made a crack that is like, you know what? I'm perfectly fine. Yeah. I know, I freaked out people. when you said that. <laughs> yeah, people are like, what? I'm like, no, I'm perfectly fine manipulating people into liking astronomy. Because at the end of the day, I don't think it has a huge impact. It's not going to have a huge impact on their life, on their well-being, if they come to the site and do some citizen science, right? But there are issues where there is a big impact, and you want to be careful. Um, and and uh, just personal beliefs in evolution is one. Um, uh, the question of whether or not to slope. vaccinate your children. I think it's children. a slippery slope. Like, you can't say, yeah. well, on my topic, it's totally okay to right, make it right. <laughs> but on others, it's not. I, I think the key to not being inappropriately manipulative is to have respect for the people you're talking to. So mm -hmm. you can use rhetorical devices shamelessly Mm -hmm. As long as you're not coming at it from a place of these people are less than me, I'm trying to change them to be better. No, you're you can use rhetorical devices and still maintain respect for your audience. I can respect my audience as someone who believes in something that I know factually is false, but I can still respect that person. Um, in the same way I want them to respect me, even though my beliefs don't line up with theirs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that goes back to where we started this conversation as well, because one of the side effects of a sort of a deficit model approach to the world is the assumption that if you don't have facts, if you are lacking those, then, I mean, quite frankly, you see this, like sometimes scientists or people who are really invested, they get arrogant. Yeah. And, then, and there's this weird thing where it's like, well, if you don't know these facts, you're stupid. Right. Um, and so that fundamental interest in respecting people, even if you're trying to change their minds, mm -hmm. and listening to them. So what we, we, if we talk about the deficit model as something that doesn't work, right now the thinking is that what does work is called the dialogue model, where mm -hmm. just through the process of having conversations with people, asking them, what they think, what they would prefer among their choices. Um, sometimes they might not get what they want in the end, but just the fact that they have been validated and listened to yeah. in a meaningful way, not just like, oh, we're just doing this pro forma, can make people feel like the entire process around that science policy decision is more legitimate yeah. and something they're more satisfied with. You need to be aware of the inherent power differentials of where you're coming from and where someone else is coming from. If you're coming across and as a, and in my experience, as an educated member of an institution that people consider an authority, even though I didn't necessarily consider myself a source of ultimate authority, I needed to be aware that I, as an educated woman, upper class white woman, in a museum center name tag was coming from a place that was very different from a um, parent bringing their child in for the community day um, and I needed to make sure that my language even if I wasn't be trying to be condescending I needed to be very aware that my language was not condescending okay. because words are difficult. Uh, words can be words are welcome. hard. Words are hard. I can't English. I can't <laughs> word. I can't word. But you need to be aware of that. You need to be aware that even when you're just throwing facts at someone, that can come across as condescending in a way that you have no intention. Like, I have no intention when I'm going, well, actually, I'm not trying to be condescending. I'm just super excited about facts. But it comes across as entirely condescending. But I'm like, oh my god, this tone, it's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm really wishing my mother was watching right now. I'm going to have to send her this because this was a struggle when I was a child. Because <laughs> at five, I was like, well, actually, tell anybody. And she had to teach me at a very young age, like, no, Nicole, people don't want to be corrected all the time. No. <laughs> they want to be listened to. <laughs> actually, that's why, I, that's why I made, you know, it's like the, the idea of wanting to persuade people to like science is so foreign because that was like no 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 don't do that <laughs> um, well, I mean, and and again because our, our education some of us you know just just fell into that and maybe didn't have to be persuaded so it just doesn't compute yeah I feel like um, 
there's two things I wanted to say at the same time. Oh no, what am I going to do? Uh, one, <laughs> one of the questions in the chat was mm -hmm. by Michael asking about whether you can start a talk with um, caveats, sort of, which feels like what we're saying here is, I think it's totally okay to embrace who you are authentically and the fact that we are mm -hmm. really excited about these facts and, and not try, what we teach in our trainings, Compass is always saying like, there's no one mold that we're trying to force people in because then you'll get people who are robotic and really bad at trying to mimic whatever they think is the standard of science communication. Sure. Um, but just because you don't intend to come across as condescending doesn't mean you're excused from having, if, as a science communicator, excused from having to improve. And this is the fun part. Like, we're all getting, we screw up all the time. We're all getting better every day. And, we ha and the only way you get better is by that feedback from the audience about, is what you're doing working? Is it connecting with them or not? Cool. Was this the comment, the State Park comment? Um, or is it yeah, another it, place? It popped up. And okay. No, it was when, when you start out with a disclaimer. Yeah, can or you start a disclaimer when you start your talk? Okay, okay. I'm not seeing that one in the Q&A. Sorry, Michael. Yeah. Um, I like, I like the Michael's, I think it's Michael's comment on not a ranger who doesn't talk about plate tectonics because yeah, can pull that um, so we did a video shoot at a state park where the ranger said uh, she doesn't talk about te plate tectonic movements because she, uh, with some she will lose their respect for their beliefs and that's something that a lot of scientists forget that the things that are just basic fundamental things to our models of the universe aren't basics to other people mm -hmm. um, I made a visitor incredibly angry by insisting that, who was it, Newt Gingrich was not an expert on volcanoes. I did not think this was a controversial comment <laughs> at all. Because, well, he's not. That's not his field. Um, he's not a volcanologist. It's just not what he does. But I made uh, parents so mad that they walked away from my wow. talk and did not come back until the end because um, I had stumbled on this thing that was a sore spot to them and I did not was not thinking quickly enough to be able to smooth that over or I wasn't even aware like sure yeah yeah because most people are not volcanologists this isn't yeah. something I mean, volcanoes are not a controversial thing volcanoes exist and work by a certain and this just goes to show that um, we often are not arguing what we think we're arguing about. Like yeah. that confrontation had nothing whatsoever to do with Gingrich's lack of a PhD no. in volcanology. It was yeah. all about worldview and perceived respect yeah. and, and who's an authority. And exactly, exactly. And, and I think that this is really important to go back to that question of privilege. I, I know we, we've talked about it, but just to drive it home, one of the other important concept that came out of Science Online was Danielle Lee talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So if you imagine a pyramid where the base of it are your, you know, the things you need to live and survive, you know, air and food and shelter and those things. And then you keep building that pyramid up. At the top are things like awe and wonder in the natural world or exploration. And so for those of us who are fortunate enough to have all our basic needs taken care of in a way that we're not struggling, um, it, it can be easy for us to say, well, why don't you care about this thing? You, sh you should care about this thing because I do. Mm -hmm. um, and that can be overlooking, you know, when people are worried about where what their kids are going to eat that night or where they're going to sleep or things like that, they don't have um, the privilege, quite frankly, to be engaging with some of these issues in the same way that the rest of us are. And this can be hard because we do live in a society that's interlinked and people's co decisions have consequences for shared resources and waterways and you know pollution and that kind of thing but it's really important to remember where we are on that pyramid and how not to talk down to people who might not be in the same space yeah uh, Pamela Pamela Gay um, talked about that she was involved with teacher training in East St. Louis, which is a, a school district that is 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 uh, struggling financially. Uh, she said it's difficult to. She says something along the lines of it's difficult to convince these teachers that they have to include space science in their lessons, when sometimes they're more worried about the fact that a significant portion of their male students are going to be in prison before they graduate. You know, how do you how do you 
even compare to something like that? How do you even compare to those those issues that are forefront in people's minds? Mm -hmm. I think again, this is it's one of those things where science is not a monolithic entity, mm -hmm. um, and just because people might be really struggling doesn't mean I don't think science is for the privileged. Like there's so many aspects of our lives and well-being that it touches on that I I think about work I used to do in Fiji and Papua New Guinea in communities where food security was a real concern and um, people were you know subsistence fishermen. And the way that science communication works most effectively in those settings is by, again, going back to their values, their concerns, the things that they're dealing with on a daily basis, rather than let's talk about how, you know, the awe and wonder of we fish science or whatever it might be. Uh, we have a, a, another interesting question from Nancy. At what point do you just proverbi proverb oh, God, proverbially, <laughs> sorry, words, again, uh, throw up your hands and admit defeat when trying to inform a denier. Denier of whatever particular science you are are trying to get at. <laughs> Did your cat just... <laughs> yes! <laughs> I'm trying to figure out which ear works. Oh. I think there's, there's a couple different filters that you might use and it really varies from topic to topic and your own disposition. Um, for me, whether you're having that conversation in good faith on both sides, mm -hmm. if someone really is willing to listen and they're engaging, I'll go a lot farther than somebody who's just trying to rack up points in front of an audience. And I think um, recognizing sometimes that maybe the person, the you know, quote unquote denier, whoever it is that you're talking to, isn't the only person paying attention to that conversation. So maybe you'll never convince them, but it's the audience who's listening and watching and paying attention helps me when I'm thinking about how do you keep your cool, how do you not devolve into name calling, even when you're really frustrated. Um, and so it's a really personal decision, though I've had some, I have to admit, some of the best conversations I've ever had around issues like climate and evolution happened where I couldn't just get away. At a, at a wedding where I was um, paired up with the groomsmen who wanted to have a big argument. And just by the fact that I had to stay there the whole night, yeah. um, I kept asking him what he thought. Like, why did he believe what he believed? And by the end of the night, he said, no one has ever talked to me about this stuff before without yelling at me and telling me I was stupid. Yeah. So that's, that's an extreme example. But I also, I think we could just wear ourselves out trying to fight every troll yeah, comes along. Yeah. It definitely varies for me. Uh, the audience question is a big one. I won't engage with a denier, for, or I will not engage with someone exhibiting denial behaviors one-on-one, um, -on -one generally, unless they are willing to listen to me in some way. Um, but if there's an audience there, I usually will engage with them, not because I think that I'm going to change the person's beliefs or their viewpoint, but because I can use that as a springboard to get information that I would want other people to hear. I can use that as a way to enforce the narrative I want someone else to hear, as opposed to them just hearing someone shouting and not getting answered at. Um, mm -hmm. And in one-on-one -on -one conversations, it has to be someone that either I know we respect each other, um, like a groomsman or like a coworker, someone who I ha already have an established amount of respect for. Um, I don't generally, for my own mental well-being, I don't generally fight with people telling me that Neil deGrasse Tyson is evil on the internet. It's just not worth my time. Um, I'm glad there are people who do that, but that's not me. I would rather talk to people who are confused or people who are maybe categorized as deniers but are really just um, want some more information. There are people who do honestly want information about what you're saying, even if they aren't going to believe it. Um, mm -hmm. But their questions sound different. They aren't the ones who come up with the canned. Um, I use 
evolution a lot because that's primarily what I've talked about in my um, in my background. Um, but they're not the one. The ones who want information are not the ones who come up with the canned answer in, answers in Genesis talking points. Mm -hmm. Those I can. Those people I can identify from a mile away and run. But there are people who, who like. Well, I'm I'm a Catholic, and I I've heard that it might be okay, but it might not, and I don't understand what's going on. Can you just tell me what the science is, and don't try to? Can you? What are you? What are your? What are your? What is your side saying? Like people who just have no clue what this fight that they're caught up in is, and that happens a lot with climate um, change. Yeah. If people I, don't even know the conversation that they think that they're part of and they would like to know. Yeah. I think there's think something, there's something really important that we're touching on here. And um, for me, it reminds me of work that Dan Kahan does. He's at Yale University. And the, the jargony word is cultural cognition. This idea that none of us, nobody, not, not even you know the most elite scientists in the world, know all the information at the technical level that it would make sense for us to know to be consumers and voters and citizens mm -hmm. in this day and age. So all of us are making decisions about who we trust to tell us what, how the world works and what we believe. And so I think being, being able to recognize that that, that identity, your cultural identity, is something valuable and important and on a day-to-day -day level might actually be much more important to your happiness and well-being than knowing specific facts. Makes it easier for me to engage again with good-willed people who might be from very different viewpoints. And I think sometimes we talk to, and the internet maybe exacerbates this, the us versus them, like there's these different camps. Yeah. When we know in reality, many of us come from families that are all over the place in terms of their political ideology or what, what we believe in, um, or even among our closest friends. When you look at attitudes towards risk, sort of bundles of perceptions, it's not that if you don't believe in climate change, then you also don't believe in vaccines. And, you know, like, too often we bundle whole worldviews together that are not appropriate, and that we're ignoring our own science when we, when we do that. Also, we tend to label people with that denier epithet, and we don't really look at what they're saying. So we say, oh, that person's a creationist. But there are many, many different kinds of creationism, from young earth, God did it, that's all, to, well, we think there was a deity involved, but the primary involvement was to what make molecules come together. Um, and those those two people would both call themselves creationists, but they're not the same set of beliefs, and they're not people who you'd engage with the same way. Um, but they've, they've been told that their label is creationist, and therefore they are firmly in the creationist camp when really it's probably closer to what I believe than what um, the evangelical far far right creationists believe. Um, so I try to go past those words. It's hard. It's really hard yeah. <laughs> to try to be like, okay, yes, I believe in evolution, or I understand evolution to be true, but let's talk about this, even though I'm in the opposite camp according to most of what culture says. So uh, what I'm uh, part of some of what I'm getting at is that there's no one monolithic goal for all of science education. Um, it's really hard to pin down any one thing. Um, some in some cases the stakes are high, like uh, for vaccines, that's a health issue. Uh, in some cases the stakes may not be so high. I just wonder about the universe. Uh, that that isn't something that is. Um, important on that that hierarchy of needs but it's it's something that a lot of people try and communicate um, what is there any specific one thing that is forefront for either of you when you are when you are communicating about science or does it really completely depend on the situation it's always situational for me and in fact I tend to use 
I tend to be a little bit different than most science communicators in that I start from a basic idea that most people I talk to are somewhat interested in the ne this nebulous concept called science. Mm -hmm. They might be interested in new medical advances or they might be interested in some topic that I haven't even heard of, but they have some interest in science so or something that they consider science or something that I would consider science. Um, so I tend to actually use science to teach critical thinking rather than trying to shove a specific part of science to the forefront because um, at the end of the day it, I am an educator with degrees in several fields so I have no particular uh, loyalty to one. I like all of the science so <laughs> I'm perfectly happy if I can talk physics with someone who's rebuilding cars and I'm also perfectly happy if I can talk about snails with a five-year-old whose primary interest is in whether they fit in her sister's nose. So um, yeah it is all situational to me. It doesn't matter I will happily talk to anyone about any science. <laughs> And, and for me, you know, the, the role I'm playing is t the science I'm communicating is sort of largely in this social science realm around what we know about communication from that research. And then I'm communicating that to scientists. Mm -hmm. And um, in that process, it has surprised me uh, the very sort of deeply unscientific arguments I've heard people make, you know, because as soon as it's outside this realm of what they know and how they relate to the world and it's in the social science rather than the natural sciences, yeah. all of a sudden they're talk they're telling stories and they're talking about anecdotes about, well, this one time this friend of mine talked to a reporter and it was a disaster, so therefore all reporters are untrustworthy, you know, things like that. Um, so I often, the thing that I always begin with is that too many times we, um, overestimate the specific knowledge of the people we're trying to talk to and underestimate their general intelligence. Yeah. And if we can stop doing that, for me, for me that's like sort of the first step. And everything else is contingent and it's complicated but interesting. <laughs> um, but if we can start there, it's a, it's a damn good place to start. Very cool, very cool. Um, there's a, an astronomy textbook author who I've been trying to get on the show but my email keeps sending him to spam for some reason. Um, Jeffrey Bennett, so he's going to be on the show at some point because he really wants to be on. Um, I heard almost the same exact thing from him talking specifically about Astronomy 101 courses. Mm. Uh, but you, you, you generalized it perfectly, I think. You know, assume that they know less astronomy than you think they know, but that they're smarter than you think they are. Um, and that is some really helpful advice for a lot of uh, uh, astronomy professors in particular, but but science educators in general. Yeah. That, that's everyone. Everyone, yeah. yeah. And <laughs> yeah. I think it's good to be able to sort of like recognize in ourselves all the time I will be surprised by I thought I had a general understanding of how X works and then I start trying to explain it to someone who actually knows or having a conversation and I realize <laughs> I have no idea. Yeah. And uh, to be able to sort of like enjoy that and then watch how I learn about things instead of penalizing that and thinking it's embarrassing or bad that I don't know something. Uh, again, sort of reconnects me to, to the joy of learning stuff, to like it being okay that we're human and we're busy and we have different needs and different perspectives on the world, but that through the process of so storytelling and science, things, we can make things better. That's, yeah. that's powerful and exciting to me. So do you have any suggestions for resources for science educators who want to do a better job, who want to connect with their audiences better, where to get started? Um, yes, so there's a group called CASE, C-A-I-S-E, and that's for the Center for the Advancement of Informal Science Education. And they've got some fantastic wiki resources, case studies, um, and a community to connect to that I would say is a great place to start. Yeah. Very cool. And, and conversations like this, I think, are so important. I've learned so much <laughs> from the conversations we had at Science Online, conversation we have here. Uh, all of that is, um, like you said, the dialogue model <laughs> really, really has something going for it. Cool. All right, so I'm going to uh, do a few quick announcements to wrap up the show, and then maybe we can leave with some last parting thoughts, last bit of advice. Um, 
So today being Wednesday means that uh, the next Hangout we have is the Weekly Space Hangout where we will throw facts at you uh, because we do a news roundup of the uh, top news stories um, in astronomy and space for the week. Uh, I think Fraser will be out of commission this week, so I'm hosting the show. It's at uh, noon Pacific. Uh, we'll be talking about the big space stories, probably a lot about dwarf planets because that seems to keep coming up in the news. On Sunday night, um, I'm not going to spit out the time. Uh, I will put it up on the site and in the newsletter because I, I know they change it a little bit uh, due to the, the daylight savings and whatnot. Um, but Sunday night is the virtual star party. Uh, it's usually on at, at a time when your time zone probably doesn't have Cosmos on at the same time. So you can watch your Cosmos and you can in, you be inspired by the imagery and the wonder and then come join the virtual star party where they'll hook up their telescopes, weather permitting, um, and show you some of the sights of the night sky. Uh, and then Monday is Astronomy Cast uh, with Pamela Fraser, assuming one or the other isn't traveling. Uh, they'll do a live broadcast um, talking about how we know what we know in astronomy. And then uh, I think Tuesday morning, uh, Pamela is hosting another Google Lunar X Prize hangout. So you can hear from the people who are literally shooting for the moon, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, so that's the, the roundup of our shows that are coming up uh, this week at CosmoQuest. I'll be sending out the newsletter later tonight, uh, probably comes out tomorrow morning. Um, so you can uh, subscribe to that at cosmoquest.org slash x slash blog over on the side. Uh, that'd be really nice if you subscribe to the newsletter. You can be up on all our weekly events and happenings. Um, Emily, Liz, do you have any last parting words about uh, science education and how great it is, even if it's hard, how great, <laughs> yeah. how, how great and important it is? Well, it is hard, but it is great. And one of the things that I has taught me the most about education is looking at places that I never thought had anything to do with what I was doing like looking and seeing what public historians are doing because as a field that's actually really well developed and they do things that we're only just starting to touch on in sciences or environmental educators who are the other side of the coin from public historians but also doing interesting things and not necessarily what you would think would work but they have they actually tend to have some good survey data on what does work. Um, there's stuff out there. There's a lot of interesting things being done. Um, even if it's weird, try it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that, that theme of let's be as critical and skeptical and experimental in our science communication as we are in doing the science itself. Yeah. Um, there was a, a line in a paper uh, that really influenced me by Baruch Fischoff that said who feel like they're being disrespected also fear that they're being disenfranchised. Mm. And so understanding that um, coming across as arrogant uh, or condescending because we assume that having greater knowledge means you'll have greater agreement with us yeah. uh, not only is not productive but um, can drive some of, you know, can drive the wedge even deeper and, and, and polarize people. And so when we realize that the solution in some, in some ways, in all meaningful ways, is to start with empathy, listening, respecting that audience, um, then we realize that it's not that education doesn't work, that's not what the deficit model is talking about, but rather when people want to be educated, they love that. And when they don't, we have to meet them where we, they are, and the solution just is not always more data. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you for discussion. having us. Yeah, this is really great. Um, I hope we can keep having this discussion because it's, I think it's really important, um, you know, for people who've been in the field forever or people who are just starting out, I think, or, you know, learning how to communicate is so important. So, thank you. Great. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. everyone. Thank you, everyone, for participating and watching, uh, and this is uh, Learning Space. We'll see you next week.